So our goal today is very specifically, we're gonna look at two types of indeterminate forms, the zero over zero form and the infinity over infinity. Now we said there were six, but these are the two we're gonna concentrate on today. And next day we're gonna concentrate on the exponential forms. And the idea is this, what if I have an indeterminate form? I've got the limit as X goes to A, let's just say of F of X over G of X. And that approaches the form zero over zero, quite simply, because f of a and g of a are both equal to zero. Now, this is what we practiced last day. This is what you did a lot of calc one. I might have a polynomial over a polynomial and x minus a is a factor of numerator and denominator. It might be, you know, sine x over x as x goes to zero. There's a lot of different ways of looking at this, but I have this type of indeterminate form which is the one we practiced the most in Calc 1 and certainly the one that we looked at most last day. Okay, we also have the ones where I'm, you know, I'm going to infinity or like polynomial over polynomial where they both grow without bound. So how do I attack these? Well, it turns out there's a, there's a little trick. Now I'm gonna go back and review a little bit of Calc 1 for you. I'm gonna remind you of something. In Calc 1, a very important theorem that we don't really go anywhere with, we just mostly state it. I've got some function and let's just say my function is, all that matters is my function is continuous between A and B and the endpoints are defined, okay? So, so it's, there's no holes, there's nothing weird between A and B and F of A and F of B exists. So in other words, this could be the endpoint of my function and this could be the endpoint of my function. That's not really important. So the term I like to use in calculus is I like to use the rolling ruler theorem. Now, if anybody's ever worked at a drafting table, at a drafting table, you've got this big open area you're writing, and maybe you're trying to draw a house, I don't know, but you want walls and floors to be parallel. Well, if you're just taking a ruler and trying to measure it with your eyes, that's difficult. So what they actually have is a ruler on wheels that you can roll up and down to maintain parallel lines. It's a very, very interesting thing. I took a drafting course back in high school and all the tables had the rolling rulers to make it easy. So here's what I want you to think. I'm gonna draw the secant line between, well, okay, that's close. I'm gonna draw the secant line between these two points. Now, a secant line is just any line that passes through the two points, okay? If I take my rolling ruler, are there any parallel lines to the secant line that would serve as tangent lines? Well, it turns out in my picture, it looks like there's a couple, maybe one right there and maybe another one about right there. So we have something in Calc 1 called the mean value theorem of derivatives. There's also a mean value theorem of antiderivatives. That's completely different. The mean value theorem of derivatives says really simply, if I have a function, okay, first of all, I have to be continuous. There can't be any breaks or any holes. Secondly, it actually has to be differentiable. That means I can't have cusps and corners and weird, you know, no weird things. So I have a function that's basically happy from point A to point B. Let's, we'll just say it like that. If I have a function that's happy from point A to point B and those points exist, they're, they're not holes there, then there's gonna be at least one tangent line that is parallel to the secant line, at least one, I'm guaranteed one. And so let's say it's that one right there. So the mean value theorem said there exists, I'm gonna use the there exists symbol, that's the backwards capital E, Z in the open interval from A to B. Z is an element of the open interval. In English, that just means Z is between A and B. That's all that means. Such that F prime of Z, that would be the slope of the tangent line passing through Z must equal the slope of the secant line. Now we just go back to baby algebra, you know, rise over run, change in Y over change in X. So that would be F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So some of you remember. Now, I don't care what symbol you use here. Um, actually, I like using a C, but in later on, they always use a Z. So I'll just use a Z for now. Z is just any number between A and B, not A and B itself though. Any number between A and B. So the concept here of this rolling ruler, I am guaranteed as long as my function is differentiable, I am guaranteed the existence of at least one value of Z. I don't need multiple. 
I just need at least one, okay? That's the mean value theorem. We're going to use this to prove a bigger one. So if you're in my Calc 1 class and we're doing this problem, I actually would tell you, okay, this is a really important theorem that we really don't have any use for now. It's a theorem that helps us build bigger theorems later. And so now is finally later, okay? So let me go back to here. And actually, let me just start from scratch now. All right, so let me give you the scenario. All right. Okay, let's suppose F and G are differentiable. over the open interval, A, B, F of A and, yeah, F of A and F of B, I'm sorry, uh, let me, let me say it, F of, I mean, let me start this again, that didn't, that didn't come out very well. Um, F of A, F of B, G of A, G of B exists, there we go, all right. So I could apply the mean value theorem to both functions, F and G. That's what, that's what we're saying, okay? Then I do know as an absolute fact then that if I said, well, there's got to be an F prime of Z equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A, that has to be true. And there has to be a, let's say G prime of Z, equal to g of b minus g of a over b minus a, okay? So we've, we've got this situation here because I'm gonna think of f and g as being kind of one, one mashed up function. But we're also gonna say that, um, again, I got the rolling rule of theorem, but I specifically want f of a and g of a to actually be zero in a moment because we wanna create a, an indeterminate form. Okay, I want to create an indeterminate form. So what I want to do is I want to find the limit as x approaches a of f of x and g of x, assuming f of a equals g of a equals zero. So in other words, I have an indeterminate form here. I can't take the limit directly because these are both zeros. So that's exactly what we've been doing. So we know if it's algebraic, I can factor and cancel. We know if it's trig-ish, I can manipulate the trig. The problem is what if it's exponential or logarithmic or something else more complicated? I may not be able to, to manipulate that. So what I wanna do is apply the mean value theorem to this. So here's the idea. Um, I use this when I prove the fundamental theorem of calculus, okay? Now let's change our interval from A to B instead now to say a to x. Let x be any number in the interval from a to b. Okay, open interval, so that means x is bigger than a for now. Then what I wanna do is use the interval from a to x and allow x to move. Right now, this is a fixed interval. There's two points. I wanna allow x to move and I want it to move closer to a. Well, because ultimately we're gonna take this limit. So then if that's the case, if X is any value in the open interval, but it's a, in variable form, then I can rewrite this as, okay, first of all, F prime of Z over G prime of Z. I want to write that first. That's going to be F of B minus F of A over G of B minus G of A. Sometimes this is referred to as Rolle's theorem also. This is, this is still from Calc 1. Okay, but I'm going to change the interval from A to B to A to X. So what that's going to do is change this, since I'm on this interval, to F of X minus F of A over G of X minus G of A. Oops, minus G of A. So now, there's nothing weird about this. This is just a simple quotient. I want a numerical value. And so what I want to do, I'm going to erase this part here now. I now want to take a limit. And this is the genius. This, this next step is the genius of the problem. 
if I said to you, what is the limit as X approaches A of all of this? As X approaches A, clearly my denominator and my numerator are both approaching zero. Right? As X approaches A, I'd basically have the form zero over zero. We know that. But if G of, of F of A and G of A were already zero, huh, then this is simply the limit as X approaches A of F of X over G of X. Now, what is it equal to? It's equal to this limit. F prime of Z and G prime of Z are just numbers because Z is a value between A and X. You're right. Z is a value between A and X. Z is a number, Z is not a variable. Now, this is how I proved the fundamental theorem of calculus in Calc 1, all right? You have a wall here. You have a wall over there and you have all the people in between, the garbage pit sequence in uh, the first Star Wars movie. What's happening to the wall over there? It's moving this way towards the wall here. This number is fixed. A is not moving, X is moving. Now, where is Z all this time? Oh, Z is just some number in between. You see, let me draw that. I have A, I have X, and I have Z just somewhere in between, but here's what's happening to X. X is coming this way. And as X comes this way further and further, what's happening to Z? Z is getting squished. Z is getting squished. Eventually X is gonna be here. Eventually X is gonna be here. If, a, if Z remains between A and X, then as X approaches A, doesn't Z approach A? Because <laughs> I'm pushing it into the wall. So that's why the garbage pit sequence is how we prove the fundamental theorem. That thing's getting squoozed in the middle. There's no difference then between the Z and the X because X is moving in it's forcing Z to move in. So this last statement would look like this. And the reason I'm replacing Z with X is because as X moves in, the distance between A and X is approaching zero. And since Z is always between them, X is basically becoming Z, kind of like picking up Z along the way. So what have we just shown? Well, we're actually done. <laughs> Let me erase this line right here. This is crazy. This is cool. This is powerful. If I have the indeterminate form zero over zero, and it turns out infinity over infinity as well. I'm not gonna show you that one. You can look that one up. If I have the indeterminate form zero over zero or infinity over infinity, then the limit of the quotient will equal the limit of the quotient of derivatives straight out of the mean value theorem. But I changed the mean value theorem. Instead of the interval from A to B, I made it the interval from A to X. That way I could take the limit for X. So whoever figured this out, well, we know who figured it out. <laughs> A certain French guy, some of you may have, may have heard his name before. Name is L'Hopital, not La Hapital. <laughs> L'Hopital. This is known as L'Hopital's rule. And L'Hopital's rule in certain situations makes finding a limit really, really easy. The problem with L'Hopital's rule is you can't use it all that often. First of all, you can only use it on certain types of indeterminate forms. I liken L'Hopital's rule to synthetic division. Okay. If I had a quotient of polynomials, I can always use long division. But with the right denominator, synthetic division is so much faster and so much easier than long division. It's just that it has a lot of restrictions. Synthetic division only works when you have one variable and your denominator is linear and the lead coefficient is a one. But that's a really common thing to have. So if you know synthetic, it's always easier and faster than long. But a lot of people don't bother with synthetic because long always works. Well, L'Hopital's rule has some serious restrictions. You can't use it all the time. But when you can use it, you see, it can make things really fast. And so we're gonna do basically tons of examples today of how to use, how and when basically to use L'Hopital's rule.
All right, let's start with a problem similar to one we did last day. We did a problem last day where we did something like this. The limit as x goes to one of um, 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 1 over um, 2x to the fourth plus 9x squared. Let's just say minus 11. OK, I don't want it to be too long. All right. The limit as x approaches 1. If I evaluate numerator and denominator at 1, I like using 1 because you can just add the coefficients. Both numerator and denominator tend to 0. So based on what we already know, I absolutely know x minus 1 is a factor of both numerator and denominator. So what we're going to do is factor the numerator. So 4, that would be 4, negative 2, negative 2, 1, 1, 0. Great. Now let's factor the denominator. I, I put those in there, don't forget the placeholders. So 1 times 2, 1 times 2, 1 times 11, 1 times 11. And zero remainder says I did it right. And I have 2x cubed plus 2x squared plus 11x plus 11. Now, clearly, I can cancel x minus 1s. I can't evaluate yet. It's still 0 over 0. But the moment I rid myself of my removable discontinuity, Now, we know algebraically that this quotient is equal to this quotient for all real numbers except 1, because 1 is not in the domain. But I want the limit as x approaches 1. I can now evaluate this. My numerator is approaching 3. My denominator is approaching 26. So my answer is 3 over 26. I don't need any special technique. But this is kind of long. Right? This is kind of a long-winded problem. So what if we applied L'Hopital's rule to this one? Let's see how that works. Now, here's where we got to be a little bit careful from a notation standpoint. The rule of thumb with limits. Limit of the thing equals limit of the thing means that these two things are absolutely identical, always except perhaps at the number in question. But I'm saying algebraically, this is equal to this, this is equal to this. Now I can evaluate. But when we use L'Hopital's rule, we're going to actually involve derivatives. So the quantities will never be equal. Ooh. So how we write it is kind of important. So we know what the answer is. So now I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule on this one. So let me erase this for a moment. So L'Hopital's rule says that this is equal to the limit as x approaches 1. Now, here's where we also get in a little bit of trouble. L'Hopital's rule involves the quotient of the derivatives. It is not the derivative of the quotient. That'd be quotient rule. A function does not equal its derivative in general. So if I have a quotient and I simply take the quotient rule, no, 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 no. That's totally an unrelated problem. I'm going to take the quotient of the independently performed derivatives. So on top, I would have 12x squared minus 12x plus 3. On the bottom, I'd have 8x cubed plus 18x. OK? Now, here's the problem. This quantity right here is not equal to this quantity right here. In fact, they're never equal. They're not even similar quantities. Different degrees. Everything about them is different. But I want to say they're equal somehow or another. So here's the way we do it. When you apply L'Hopital's rule to a limit, your new result is going to give you the same numerical answer, although the functions themselves will not be equal. And normally, when you put an equal between limit, you're saying the functions themselves are equal. So what we do, here's the kind of the traditional universal approach, is we put a little LH above the equal sign, technically L apostrophe H. And I am saying these are true by L'Hopital's rule. They are not true algebraically. They're true by L'Hopital's rule. In the previous problem, all my limits were equal algebraically. 
because I was taking the same quantity and just manipulating it. Now we've completely changed the quantity, but we're saying via L'Hopital's rule, this is a true statement. And this is no longer an indeterminate form. And oh, and by the way, what's the answer? Three over 26. Oh, 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 oh that was cool. That was so much easier. So L'Hopital's rule is extremely useful when you have rational functions, particularly of large degree. If I had, you know, quadratic over quadratic, I can factor and cancel faster than I can take the derivative in all likelihood. So in other words, it doesn't really matter. But if I have a higher degree, doing the factoring and canceling can be really time consuming, okay? So that might take me a little while. So here's a perfect example. Now, try another one, all right? We said in Calc 1, the two most important limits involving trig in Calc 1, we know. The limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x, and the limit as x approaches zero of one minus cos x over x. We use those to derive all the trig, all the trig calculus. Now, this one we proved geometrically. And in case you don't remember or you didn't see, I'm not going to prove it. I'm just going to tell you what the proof looked like. What we did was we have a picture like this. I have three shapes here. I have the inner triangle, I have the outer triangle, and I have the pi shaped wedge called a sector. And those three shapes have three different areas that would set up a three way inequality between the areas. When I take the limit as the angle goes to zero, we come up with this limit using the squeeze sandwich theorem. The squeeze theorem and sandwich theorem are the same thing, just which, which term does that textbook use? So we did this purely geometrically by finding the three areas, comparing them to three-way inequality and then manipulating them. So in, if you're in my Calc 1, we did this day three of class. You may, maybe you don't remember the details, but you remember doing it. Uh, in the Tan book, he does a really nice job of explaining that. Now, that's how you prove that. But now that we have this additional piece of information, even though we know everything about derivatives at this point, and by the way, the reason you should never even hear the term L'Hopital's rule in Calc 1, you do limits on day one of Calc 1. You don't do derivatives for a while. Kind of hard to justify taking a limit using the derivative when you've never even used the word derivative in your entire life up to that point. So there's a reason we wait to do L'Hopital's rule. First of all, you have to know all differentiation, all things about exponential logarithmic functions, because about 99.9% .9 of the time you use L'Hopital's rule, it will involve an exponential or logarithmic function. So you don't, you never have to use L'Hopital's rule if it's trig. You never have to use L'Hopital's rule if it's polynomials. It's just sometimes it's more convenient. So if I use L'Hopital's rule here, and I said, all right, by L'Hopital's rule, this is the derivative, excuse me, the, the limit of the derivative of the numerator, which is cos x, the derivative of the denominator would just be one. And as x goes to zero, well, cos zero is one. And by the way, that is our result. We just couldn't do that on day three of calc one. How about this one? By L'Hopital's rule, I get what? The limit as x goes to zero of the derivative of negative cosine would be positive sine. And the bottom, I'd get a one, and that limit is zero. And that's exactly what we knew it was. Awesome, okay? So that turns out to be quite the bonus, okay? So L'Hopital's rule applied in this situation works, works beautifully. Now, L'Hopital's rule is legal many, 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 many times, but not necessarily efficient. Now, the same thing is true if I have the indeterminate form infinity over infinity, then the limit is of the derivatives. So let's suppose I had the following. The limit as x goes to infinity of, let's say, 9x to the 4 minus 3x squared plus 2 over um, 7x to the 4 plus 5x cubed minus 3x. All right. I can use L'Hopital's rule on this. This is the form infinity over infinity. I'll even put it here. It's always a good idea to identify the form because the form tells me my strategy most of the time. So if I apply L'Hopital's rule, I'm going to get 36x cubed minus 6x 
over 28x cubed plus 15x squared. Great. Um, but this is still the indeterminate form, infinity over infinity. Well, I can use L'Hopital's rule again. You can actually keep using L'Hopital's rule until it's no longer an indeterminate form. That's what you do. All right, great. So I L'Hopital it again, and I'm going to have, what, uh, 108x squared minus 6. Here I'm going to have 80, oops, 84 x squared plus 30x. And that's still infinity over infinity form. Okay, well, let's just do it again. This is so much fun, we'll just keep going. And now I have 216x, and on the bottom I'm gonna have 168x plus 30. And it's still an indeterminate form. So let's do it one more time. I think you, you're getting my point on this one, at least I hope. Now it's 216 over 168. Now I have the limit of a constant. The limit of a constant is the constant. Great. 216 over 168. Can I reduce that bad boy? Well, let me use my fraction key. All right. So everything we said was true and correct. And my answer is 9 sevenths. Yes. Um, or I'm asking you the limit to infinity of irrational function where the degree of the numerator and denominator are the same. Don't we know the answer is nine sevenths, like in one second? <laughs> yeah, we knew the answer was nine sevenths before we even have to do any work. We could multiply top and bottom by one over x to the fourth and get nine sevenths. So L'Hopital's rule was legal. Never in a million years do L'Hopital's rule on an infinity over infinity form. So in case you really are tempted to use L'Hopital's rule, you know, I'll make these exponents really, really large, you know, 400th power. That means I got to do this 400 times. No, no, you don't use L'Hopital's rule. It's legal, but it'd be foolish because it would take you a really, really long time. And you already knew the answer was nine sevenths. So there are certain situations, this is one of them, where it's really not efficient. Let's do another one. Again, I don't want it to be a complicated one. We'll keep it real simple. All right, let's take, because we're going to do lots of L'Hopital's rule, but I also want you to know when it may not be a good idea. I want, in limit as x goes to infinity, let's say of um, x squared plus 2x. Keep it simple. And on the bottom, how about 3x plus 5? Now, last day we went over a problem of this nature and the trick was factoring numerator and denominator and canceling the common factor and then looking at the transient terms. This actually could be a very fast process. But because numerator and denominator both tend to infinity, I can use L'Hopital's rule. So let's see how, how easy it is if I use L'Hopital's rule. So if I use L'Hopital's rule and always put this because that justifies what I'm gonna do next. The derivative of my numerator, think of this as to the one half power. So it'd be one half x squared plus two x to the negative one half times two x plus two all over three. Well, that sure seems easy enough. Well, let's see. This guy's gonna have to go downstairs. All right, so the root's gonna go downstairs and I already have a three. I have two x plus two times a half, so that's just x plus one. Notice I'm saying just equal, because now I'm saying algebraically, this quantity is identical to this quantity algebraically, they are. I haven't done anything, so this is just a regular old everyday equal sign. Infinity over infinity form, let's use L'Hopital's rule again. All right, so I'm at a one on top. Think of this as one half power again. So it'd be three times a half x squared plus two x to the negative half times two x plus two. All right. Well, this guy's gonna need to go upstairs. So I'll put that guy on top. Okay. I have a two x plus two times the three halves. So that'd be three times x plus one. All right, now we're getting somewhere, aren't we? Um, 
Anybody want to guess how many more steps I have to do L'Hopital's rule on this one? Just hold on a number. Infinitely for more. <laughs> yeah, it's, you guys notice something about my root? It's going to bounce top and bottom for the rest of eternity. Yeah. Can't use L'Hopital's rule and get roots. It won't work. It won't work for the reason that you just keep going back and forth. So although it's legal, <laughs> it's not going to help. No, what we did last day where we factored, factored, canceled. That's, that's how you do that problem. Because it's legal doesn't necessarily mean it's efficient. So I don't want to say it's a rule, but you notice the ones that seem to give us the most trouble for L'Hopital's tend to be the ones where I'm going to infinity. So personally, I just never use L'Hopital's rule if it's going to infinity. I just Now, there are exceptions, and we're going to look at some of the exceptions. But when quantities are approaching infinity, L'Hopital's rule isn't always a good fit. Okay, not always. So now I'm going to do one where it's approaching infinity, where it actually is a good fit. Okay. Um, oh, actually, not yet. I'm going to do it in a minute. So I'm going to say something algebraic. Is it true that for a not zero, is that a true statement in general, assuming A is not zero? Yell it out. Yes or no? Is that always true? Yeah. Yeah, the reciprocal of the reciprocal. So if I had something of the form A over B, that's the same as 1 over B over A. If I have something in the form A times B, that's the same as saying A over one over B, or it's B over one over one over A. Does everybody see that? I'm just manipulating numbers. It doesn't matter if A and B are positive, negative, integers, fractions. That, that's not important. It's assuming they're not zeros. Can I do this? Yes, I can. So here's the question I'm going to ask you now. I would like the limit as x goes to, how about, um, keep it simple, x goes to zero from the right of x log x. Now, x log x is a very interesting graph. Y equals x log x is really, really interesting. And we, we do this one in Calc 1. And I'm going to come back to how to answer that one in a moment. But this is a graph that we look at in Calc 1 because it is, it is kind of cool. So if we start with y equals x log x, first of all, the domain is only positive numbers. The log of zero does not exist and log of a negative number is imaginary. So the domain has to be um, only to the right of the y-axis. Okay, so what's the derivative of this guy? Well, it's first times derivative of second plus second times derivative of first. We know that. And if I set this equal to zero, this will equal zero when x is e to the negative one or one over e. Oh, okay. So now what's the y value? Well, e to the negative one is negative one. So it'd be negative e to the negative one. So that means graphically, here's what I absolutely know. First of all, when x is 1, the log is 0. As x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, this is going to grow without bound. There's no question that this is going to go in a general this way direction. Is it bending up? Is it bending down? Well, that's concavity. But I know it's going to go up forever. The question is, what is happening between 0 and 1? Well, 1 over e is around 0.37. A little more than a third. So I'm going a little more than a third and down to about there. So I know there's a horizontal tangent at this point right here, which is one over E, negative one over E. So my question is what's happening now between these two guys? Well, I have a few different possibilities. My curve could be going up. It could be going in. It could be going down. In other words, log has a vertical asymptote here. So maybe this has a vertical asymptote. Hmm. It could be going just towards the axis and then I have a removable discontinuity or it could be going up. But since x log x only equals zero once, this only crosses the x-axis 
one time. It never crosses again. So this could be pointing up, but it never touches the x-axis again. So now I really, really want to know where's this going? That means I need a limit. So it's either going to have a finite limit or the limit's going to be negative infinity. Those are my only possibilities if you look at it. I know it can't be going up to positive infinity because that would require it crosses the axis again. So I want this limit. What is the form? Well, if I'm, a, by the way, it has to approach zero from the right because of the domain. As X approaches zero, well, then I'm approaching zero. But what's the log doing? Oh, as X is approaching zero from the right, the log is going down forever. In other words, the log is growing infinitely. It's negative infinity, but it's still infinite in nature. So we say this has this form, and this is an indeterminate form. I have a product of things, one growing without bound, one approaching zero. Okay, I, there's no trick to that. I can't do anything. Well, can you use L'Hopital's rule? I kind of need a quotient. <laughs> I can't use L'Hopital's rule. Well, at least not yet. Anybody, anybody got an idea? An idea how I can manipulate this? I think I just showed you a moment ago. You want to recast it so that it's in either zero over zero or infinity over infinity form? Beautiful. So I have two possibilities. This or this. Everybody understand? It's one of the two. Meaning, I can absolutely guarantee you the truth of the following statement. I can write this as x over 1 over log x. Or I can write this as log x over 1 over x. Again, I'm approaching 0. I'm never equal to 0. Both of these statements are absolutely correct. One of them is a dead end. <laughs> Which one do you think we should do? The first one where I'm going to have to differentiate the reciprocal of the log function? Mm. Or this one where both of these derivatives are really easy? I think I just answered the question. This one because both of them are really easy. Yeah. When you have this type of indeterminate form, you're going to do this every time. You're going to take your product and write it as a quotient. One of the terms will now, they'll either both approach infinity or they'll both approach zero, depending on which one you move downstairs. More often than not, although I can absolutely write this both ways, the vast majority of the time, only one of them is actually going to work. You see, if I differentiate this, I'm still going to be stuck with a log in the next step, but it's just going to be log raised to a power, which actually got worse, not better. So I want to go this route. So now I can use L'Hopital's rule on this. Don't forget to write the limit because you haven't evaluated it yet. What is the derivative of the log function? Well, that's just one over x. What's the derivative of one over x? Well, that would be negative one over x squared. Now, you're looking at this going, oh no, as x approaches zero from the right, this is growing without bound infinitely. That's it, oh no, it's infinity over infinity. Well, you can simplify the, the quantity first. That's probably what you want to do. See, I don't want to look at this as indeterminate forms. No, just simply simplify that. Won't this just be negative x? Ah, so now the limit as x goes to zero of negative x is just zero. That means that that cool graph that I just did has a removable discontinuity at the origin because x was approaching zero and that limit approached zero. Now that's kind of cool if you think about it. You had no, no way before today of ever determining what that value was. And now you go, oh, okay. That, that cool graph of x log x is going to approach the origin and then have a hole there. That's kind of a neat thing. So here's where L'Hopital's rule is extremely useful. There is no algebraic steps that I could perform to do this limit because it involves a log. There is no algebra you can perform on a log ever to find a limit, not, not on the log. So that's where the L'Hopital's rule will come in particularly. On rational functions, I can actually do the algebra every time. L'Hopital's rule might make it faster, but I never actually have to use it, okay? So how about if we have something like this? Um, let me think uh, something, I'd like to do something diabolical here. How about I've got, the limit as x goes to zero, once again, uh, I'll say from the right of x 
cosec index. Now, in the last example, we made that easy. And by the way, cosecant of zero is undefined because sine of zero is zero. Oh, so cosecant is actually growing without bound. So this, this is the form, by the way, zero times infinity. So in the last example, we just moved the x downstairs. So let's do that again. OK. What I just wrote absolutely is correct. I didn't violate any rules because x is approaching 0. x is never equal to 0. You can't take the cosecant of 0, but I can approach 0. So now we will use L'Hopital's because this is now of the form infinity over infinity. And so when I do L'Hopital's rule, my numerator is going to be the derivative of the cosecant, which is negative cosecant x cotan x. And my denominator is negative one over x squared. Oh, wait a minute. Did that get better or did that get worse? Anybody? Worse. Yeah, it's kind of like way worse. Yeah. No matter how I manipulate this, I'm going to have to keep going and that numerator and denominator keep growing. So I want you to repeat after me. This is very important. When it comes to limits, say it. When it comes to limits, cosecant and cotangent are evil. That's it. When it comes to limits, cosecant and cotangent are evil. And I'll give you a hint. You can never take a limit involving a cosecant or a cotangent. It's kind of like the square root problem that I did. This is an infinite loop, but worse, the square root just kept bouncing back and forth and it didn't make the quotient more difficult. This is going to grow exponentially and get worse on every step. You can't do any sort of limit thing with cosecants and cotangents. So therefore, you want to use the reciprocals. So although this step was legal and it kind of looked like what I just did with the log, it's because the reciprocal of the log is horrible. I never want to do a reciprocal of a logarithm, but the reciprocal of cosecant, that's sine. Yeah, I definitely want to do the reciprocal of cosecant. So I sometimes have to do this. You know, you remember when we first learned integration by parts, right? The Knight and the third Indiana Jones movie talked about the guy making a poor choice. Yeah, this would be another one of those poor choices. It's not wrong. This is not wrong. It's just a dead end. So instead, it's the cosecant that I, I'm going to have issues with. So let's write it as x over 1 over the cosecant. No, x over sine. To multiply by the cosecant and to divide by the sine. Now, if this were the final answer to an algebra question, no, you would say that's my final answer because it's not a quotient. But in terms of taking the limit, I want to employ L'Hopital's rule. Now, I can do this one using Calc 1 techniques. I can you know, do the reciprocals, and I can mess around, and we'll get an answer. But L'Hopital's rule, I will be done in the next step. So this will be the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of 1 over the cosine function. And that limit is simply 1. Beautiful. So. Any time you have the indeterminate form zero over zero or infinity over infinity, the problem is eligible to use L'Hopital's rule. It doesn't necessarily mean you will. You know, in my, my count three, they did limits for the first time last week. And they're doing limits now in three dimensions. So X and Y are both independent variables. And I, I did a problem. And the first thing someone says is, can we use L'Hopital's rule? And I said, no, because L'Hopital's rule only exists with one independent variable. So as cool as it is, its uses are extremely limited. And unfortunately, after about, I don't know, next week, except on an exam, you're probably never even going to use it again because <laughs> you don't really keep doing limits except in 3D, you learn how to do them. And there's no L'Hopital's rule in higher dimensions. So it's wonderful when it works. It's just you can't use it all that often. So like synthetic division, I want you to have it as a tool because when it works and when it's appropriate, it is an unbelievable time saver and definitely makes things easier. You just have to know when you can use it, okay? So let's do another problem. Okay. Let's suppose, I'll keep it simple. I've got the limit as X goes to one. Um, I, I'm gonna do two this time, one's getting used up. Uh, how about um, 
x cubed minus um, 3x squared plus 4 over um, x squared minus 4. Let's keep it real simple here. Now, obviously, we can use L'Hopital's rule on this one. Well, let's make sure. 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 squared plus 4 is 0. 2 squared minus 4. Okay, I can use it. Okay, I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule on this one. And we're also going to do it the traditional way. But I want to do it the traditional way first. I'm going to go ahead and do the synthetic on top. 1, negative 3, 0, 4. Okay, so we're going to do the traditional way first, the, the non lopish way. Okay, this is no longer an indeterminate form. So what is my answer? Two times two squared, that's eight. Minus two minus two, that's four. Two plus two is four. Beautiful, okay? This limit is in fact one. Great. Now, let's L'Hopital it, shall we? L'Hopital is gonna become a verb, by the way, in case you didn't know that. So I'll say, how do I do it? I'll just L'Hopital it. <laughs> All right, so when I L'Hopital this one, I'm going to get and 3x squared minus 6x on top and 2x on the bottom. And then when I L'Hopital that one, I'm going to get 6x minus 6 on top over 2 on the bottom. And then, heck, I'll just you know, L'Hopital that one again. No, nope, can't L'Hopital it again because that would give me a zero on the bottom. Oh, but I don't have to. I can evaluate. Great. And so I've got six times two, which is 12. 12 minus six is six. Six over two is three. Okay, great. Um, uh, Houston, we have a problem. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> One of these things doesn't belong. You can't um, use the L'Hopital's rule after the first time. Beautiful. Why? the it's not in an indeterminate form beautiful that's that's two you get that that's worth 200 miles you, you guys you are aware that i give out airline miles for good work good behavior i don't know if i've made that clear i give out airline miles throughout the course of the semester um they have no cash value and they're not actually redeemable for anything but it makes people feel really good but anyway no, perfect answer i just made the only mistake that people make in general I have so much fun doing L'Hopital's rule that even after it no longer applied, I just kept going. I couldn't help myself. But the problem is, this is an indeterminate form. This is not. You can't keep going if it's not an indeterminate form. As an absolute, you will always get the wrong answer because you've changed the problem in a way that can't be undone. This is why I did it this way first. No one would have known that that was the wrong answer, but we all believe this was correct, inefficient, but correct. Oh my goodness, there's a problem. That's because this isn't an indeterminate form. So as, as Joshua said, I should have evaluated it here. Three times two squared, that's 12. Did I do the, oops, there's not something not right here. Hold on. Three times two, uh-oh. Or the phone, do I have a, I've got an error somewhere. Yikes, hold the phone. Um, there I is... think you did your synthetic division wrong in the first time. Oh, I think I did too. Oh my goodness. Because I'm looking that down the ride to me either. Let's fix that one really quick, shall we? <laughs> oh, so now neither one of them are good. Oh my goodness. Let's try that again. Zero, four, two, negative one, negative two, negative two, negative four, zero. Yeah, the first time you brought down the one, the two. Added two. Oh. I saw that, but oh. you already erased it and you looked so happy, so I left it. Okay, so is that cool then? Same. That's what it should be. Do you all agree? Yeah, that's what I got. Okay, good, 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 good. Now, what does that make our answer? Two zero. Square minus two, that makes our answer zero. 
At this point of the game, if I plug in the two, what does it make our answer? Zero. That's, that's a good thing. I'm glad we caught that one. That would have been terrible. You would have gone home and said, I thought I understood math. I know everything's wrong now. Okay, so traditional L'Hopital's, they agree this was faster. But the problem is a lot of times we do the extra step. And I'm telling you this right now, on the very first quiz I get, there will be a significant number of problems where people did it too many times because they weren't sure where to stop. Remember, it's the only reason you used it in the first place is because you started with an indeterminate form of zero over zero, probably, and said, okay, I cannot evaluate this. That's an absolute mathematical impossibility. You cannot evaluate an indeterminate form because it's not even a number. After one run of L'Hopital's rule, now you ask yourself, is it still an indeterminate form? And if it is, by the way, then you do use L'Hopital's rule again. That does not mean you're caught in an infinite loop. No, 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 no. <clears throat> What if? Right now, obviously, x minus 2 is a factor of numerator and denominator. What if it were the square of x minus 2 or a factor of numerator and denominator? Then you would have had to do L'Hopital's rule twice to get that out of the problem. Uh, so if this factor were raised to a higher power, that would tell you that I have to do L'Hopital's rule repeatedly. And that's not incorrect. That's not the loop that I talked about with like you know cosecant or something. No, that would be the right thing to do. That's why it's absolutely imperative. Each time you do it, you check. Okay, I can evaluate. It's an indeterminate form. It's one or the other. If I can evaluate, I'm done. So this line should never have happened. What if this was still an indeterminate form? Then I would do the next line. But it's an absolute that I have to get the same answer algebraically as I do L'Hopital's rule, or that means I did one of them wrong. Okay, so let's try another one. This is one of my favorites because this comes up a lot in the later chapters as well. Something of the following form. Let me do this. I have a limit as x goes to infinity of how about um, 3x squared times the sine of 4 over x cubed. Oh, that just looks absolutely hideous. Well, let's let's examine it for a moment. Now, before. I said the, the limits to infinity are the ones that typically give us the most issues with L'Hopital's rule. That doesn't mean they all do. But if we're going to have issues, it's typically on the infinite limits. OK, that's, that's just the way it is. So as x grows without bound, obviously, 3x squared is growing without bound. Now let me throw a what if at you. What if the sine function was also growing without bound? Anybody got an idea? What if both of these are growing without bound? And it's just infinity. Yeah, your limit's just infinity. It's, that's not interesting. Oh, okay. It's not an indeterminate form if they're both growing without bound. What if they're both approaching zero? I have a product and they're both approaching zero. It's just zero. There's just zero. And we sometimes get confused because we're, we're looking for things. I have a quotient. Zero over zero, great. I have a quotient approaching infinity over infinity, great. I have a product, zero and infinity, infinity and zero, great. But those are the only indeterminate forms we're gonna see. Zero times zero is not an indeterminate form. Infinity times infinity. Zero over non-zero is just zero. So sometimes the answer is right in front of us, but we're not looking for it. And so we, we keep going, kind of like the doing L'Hopital's too many times. So as X grows without bound, for over x cubed is a transient term that approaches zero. So the sign of that is approaching zero. So this one is fair game, but we have to check. Okay, gotta be really careful with that one. Okay, so now what do I do? Well, if I move the sign downstairs, it becomes cosecant cubed, and we know that's just evil. I know it's sometimes fun to be evil. You know, Darth Vader's way cooler than Luke, but. When it comes to math problems, you don't want evil L'Hopital's problems. That's just, that, that's no fun. No, let's move the X downstairs. So, but it's fun to be bad sometimes. Yeah, but this ain't that time, trust me. Now, do I move the three downstairs or just the X squared downstairs or does it matter? Anybody? Can't yeah. you just move it to the front of the limit? I can, or it doesn't matter. I can just leave it here, but here's the thing. This is a one over X squared. I can put the three here or I can put the three here. Put the three here. If you put it here, 
you run the risk of making an algebra error somewhere. I don't take the coefficient and move it. The coefficient is not the thing that's approaching zero or infinity. So Leo, can I move it on the outside? Sure, absolutely. I just wouldn't put it here because it makes that derivative a little bit more awkward. So right now, algebraically, these quantities are in fact equal. Now, my numerator is approaching zero, my denominator is approaching zero because transient terms approach zero. That's why they're called transient terms. Okay, now I can use L'Hopital's rule. And if I'm lucky, I only have to do it once. All right, let's do the bottom first because that seems to be the easier. Think of this as x to the negative two. So then it would be negative two x to the negative three. And you could certainly write it with a negative exponent. That's not a problem, okay? Now, the, hang on one second, let me undo this. Oh, hang on one sec. Hello? Okay, good. And now the top three cosine thing. I know that part, that's easy. But now I need the derivative of thing. Four X to the negative three. So negative 12 X to the negative four, negative 12 X to the negative four. And there's nothing wrong with writing negative exponents. That, that's totally okay. Now you say, oh, this is still an indeterminate form. Yeah, but you can simplify this. Don't keep going. I can cancel things. So it would be silly to keep going because I can simplify it. So one of the other things about L'Hopital's rule is evaluate when you can evaluate the way I've written it. This is still an indeterminate form because that's approaching zero and that's approaching zero. But I have x's to powers that can easily be combined or canceled. So I should do that before I do anything else. So right now, the easiest thing I could possibly do is multiply top and bottom by the reciprocal. So let's multiply top and bottom by negative x cubed over two. Now I will no longer have a quotient, at least in, in, the, in this part of the world. So this is now equal to, all right. So I've got a three, I've got a negative 12, I've got a one half. So it looks like negative 18. I've got an X cubed and I have an X on the bottom. Hmm. And I have a cosine. Sorry, this is gonna be hard to read. Okay, I think this is what I have at this point. Okay. I'm gonna have one extra X on the bottom. I'm gonna have this constant and everything else canceled. Is this an indeterminate form? X is approaching infinity. Is that an indeterminate form? No. What's happening to this guy? Becomes one. Yeah, as X grows without bound, four over X cubed approaches zero and the cosine of zero is one. That's not an issue, one is fine. So my numerator is finite and my denominator is growing without bound. So if my numerator is finite and my denominator is growing without bound, what would my answer be? Zero. Zero. Whoa, may not have seen that one coming. By the way, so, Rather than program your brain to say, aha, x to power sign like that is going to be zero. Well, actually, if I manipulate those exponents, I could make it infinity. I can manipulate the exponents and make it a constant. No, no, <laughs> if there's no rule as to what my answer is going to be. There's only how I attack the problem. I make one small change that can completely affect the answer, but I would still attack it the same way because of the nature of the indeterminate form. So this one's kind of cool. Now, one of the ones we did last day, let me see if I can recreate it because I never actually remember the problems I make up. I generally just make them up like right then and there. I'm not that good that I actually, you know, think to write them down first. So we had the limit as X goes to infinity. I think we did something like this. Um, the square root of four X squared, you know, minus four X minus two X. I, I, I don't know if that's what it was. It was something like that. Now, as X grows without bound, the quantity on the left is growing without bound and the quantity on the right is growing without bound and I'm taking a difference. So clearly this is of the form infinity minus infinity. Question, can I use L'Hopital's rule on this? Right now, can I use L'Hopital's rule on this? Anyone? 
No, because it's not a quotient. It's not a quotient, yeah. It's an indeterminate form, but it's not the right kind. Now, what we did last day, if you remember, is we multiplied numerator and denominator by the conjugate of what's right there. And we part of the reason, by the way, we did that was actually to create a quotient. So if I multiply by 4x squared minus 4 plus 2x over 4x squared minus 4 plus 2x. Now, what we did last day is we did all the algebra first, and then we wrote the limit, but this is OK. So my denominator is going to be this. Now, my numerator is going to be 4x squared minus 4 minus, or sorry, minus 4x minus 4x squared. A minus B times A plus B is A squared minus B squared. So this. Um, should you have an extra X on your bottom in the root there? Oh, thank you. I don't want to write and that. And where you multiplied also? Yeah, I don't know why I just didn't want to write that X, did I? <laughs> yeah, my, my arm's getting tired. You know, saving, some, saving some trouble there. All right. Um, so now I got this icky thing right here. Now, we did this problem or a version of this last day. So what we did last day was we factored. We factored and canceled, and then we were able to evaluate. And that was all valid. The question is now, numerator and denominator are both growing without bound. Can I use L'Hopital's rule? By the way, the numerator is approaching negative infinity. That's true. But it's not the negative. It's the fact that it's infinite that's relevant. It'd be like saying, well, but you approached zero from the left. Yeah, but I'm approaching zero, you know. I'm, I'm growing without bound positively or negatively is not the issue. I'm growing without bound top and bottom. Is this eligible for L'Hopital's rule? Anybody want to try that one? Can I use L'Hopital's rule on this one? No, the top one's a negative infinity and bottom's positive infinity, isn't it? And I just so turned it. So oh, you just turned it. They're both, they're both growing without bound. Positive and negative don't matter. What, what, so what's positive and negative? If, if my answer is finite, the positive and negative just means it's a positive answer or a negative answer. But it doesn't affect the fact that it's an indeterminate form. Can I use L'Hopital's rule on this? Numerator and denominator are both growing without bound. So it's just a yes. I'm not saying should I. I'm saying can I. I think no. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, again, sign doesn't matter. It's that they're both growing without bound. They're, they're infinity over infinity is the form. So tell me why I don't want to use L'Hopital's rule on this one. I'll give you a hint. It's one word, starts with an R, rhymes with Groot. Um, Square root. Yeah. You don't want to use L'Hopital's rule. This would be the infinite loop. It's legal, but not recommended. So what we did by factoring and canceling last day is, is the way to go on this one. Now. It's because of the root in the original problem, it's extremely unlikely that the manipulation would make it so that L'Hopital's would be the right way to go. It's just, it's probably not gonna happen. Now, I wanna go back to something because this actually comes up, this comes up in Calc 3 even all the time. If I said to you, F of X is, I'll keep it simple, you know, 2X cubed minus 10X squared plus 5X plus one. Now, if I said, what's the limit as x goes to infinity? Most of you don't even give it a second thought. But technically, that's going to positive infinity. That term's going to negative infinity. And do I have an infinity minus infinity case? Ooh, do you all realize that that, that is a legitimate question right now? I have a polynomial. These guys differ in sign. And, and every term with an x in it, Heck, let me just get rid of the one altogether. Every one of these terms is growing without bound, but one of them is going to negative infinity. So why is it that we say, without doing any work whatsoever, why do we just say this is infinite? Growth rate? Sorry, say again? Uh, I said growth rate, that the but, high. But how, I mean, if both of these are growing without bound, now, I, I've heard a lot of people give me a lot of really crazy reasons. I had one person tell me, well, in was in calculus, they called it the domination theorem. <laughs> okay, that sounds kind of creepy. I go, what does that mean? They said, well, you only have to look at one term in any limit. And then I said, 
So therefore, when they told me that, I, I couldn't help but do this one. The single most important limit that exists, I said, what's the answer to that? Of course, the answer is one. No, the answer is E. There's no such thing as a domination theorem and, and you'll get the wrong answer. No, 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 no. But I want you guys to know, why is this answer infinite? Well, I gave you a hint last day. I don't want you to ever do this. But if someone needs explaining, you can always do this. Factor out the X cubed. And what do you have? You all agree with that? Yep. I think I did that right. Absolutely, these are equal as long as X is not zero. Now I'm going to let X grow without bound. These are transient terms. So as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, believe it or not, now I don't want you to do this in general, you can get a little bit of trouble, but even in upper level statistics, we do do this. As X gets bigger and bigger, the contributions of these guys get less and less and less, and it's looking more and more like it is correct to say this is asymptotic, not because I lopped off the last terms, no, 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 but because when I factored, I created transient terms, and that's how you get asymptotic convergence. So if I asked you to graph this and this on the same set of axes, they will look totally different for small values of x, but the further and further and further you go away from the origin, the bigger and bigger and bigger x gets, the difference between them, or I should say really the ratio, if I said one divided by the other, that would be another way of thinking about it, is approaching one. It's never equal to one. They are never equal to each other. But the bigger X gets, the more this is going to look like this because of the transient terms. It's for this reason that when you have a polynomial, and I'm, only, I'm limited to polynomials, when you have a polynomial, the highest degree term is the one that determines the behavior when you're approaching infinity because you can always factor it out. That's an absolute. You're never going to see that in a calculus book. You're just going to be told, you know, look at the highest degree term. But you should question it because a problem like this, that approach to infinity, that approach to infinity, we had to manipulate. We had to do stuff. We couldn't say, well, that one's bigger than that one. No, no, you, you can't do that because it's, it's not true. It's not a polynomial. But in this case, since this is equal to this, ah, when I take the limit as x goes to infinity, this is looking basically like 2x cubed and the limit's going to be infinite. Don't say that... Don't say that the limit and then chop it off. No, just the limit of this is infinite because the lead term is going to determine it because of this. It's not a domination thing. It's the fact that you could factor it out and get transient terms. And the key is the existence of the transient terms. There are no transient terms in this form. They're only in this form. I don't need you to ever do this. I want you to understand this so that you have absolute certainty. When asked, what's the behavior of this? You go, well, it's going off to infinity. Right? You know that, that this is going off to infinity in that direction and negative infinity in the other direction because the lead term is going to determine the behavior because the lead term is the only one that we're really going to see when X gets big, positively or negatively. So that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Now, the gnarlier of the gnarly problems, we are going to look at a week from today. Okay, the ones that the hardest types of limits that we examine in calculus are the exponential forms. And, and I mentioned this last day, the the forms where I have um, zero and I'm raising it to a power that's approaching zero, or like the, the E, the base is approaching one, but the exponent is growing without bound. It'll be extremely rare that this one will ever actually produce a value of one, by the way. This one you know, could be zero, could be infinity, it could be seven. You don't know before you start. But I'll give you a hint. In both of these cases, you will see exponentials in logs. And that's why they're a little bit trickier because I can't use algebraic techniques on exponents and logs. I can only use them for, you know, polynomial-ish things. So now the lecture part is done. I want to talk about the exam now, the logistics and stuff. And we'll stop. We'll take a break. We'll have office hours. And that's kind of the time you can ask the specific questions if you want on, you know, practice tests and so on. So the exam is class. Okay, it's not going to be some other time. Now, I am notorious with Monday, Wednesday classes. I love having Friday exams during the semester because I like to get as many meetings as humanly possible. I, I like having extra classes. In the fall, we had two Monday holidays, for example. So I gave Friday exams in my Monday, Wednesday classes to get back lecture time. We're not doing that because we don't need to. We're only losing one class this semester for a holiday. Now, the, the, the class is the exam. The, our class starts at 11.10. At about 11 o'clock, I am going to email you 
the exams. Okay, so you'll be right there on your screen. I will send it as, by the way, I'll send it in PDF form just in case you got an old computer that doesn't like to open things and you know weird stuff goes on. I'm going to email you the exam. You have one of two choices: you're either going to print the exam because you have a printer, and if you do, please print the exam. You'll you'll be happy. Or you're going to just write down the problems. You could do it with a split screen, but that means you got to spend the whole exam with your nose this close to the screen, and you know I just don't think that's really good for the eyes. You're going to do the exam. When time is up, you have two hours. When time is up, you're going to take your cell phone using the fast scanner app and please nothing else. I'm so tired of people sending me emails that don't exist or I don't get. I just had somebody send me another one. He even said using fast scanner app, he just forgot the attachment part. You take a phone, uh, your picture of each page in a row. So click, 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 send. Okay, the fast scanner app, you can do 10 pages as one PDF. Please, a couple things. Make sure all your pages are oriented in the same direction. They're not sideways because it's harder to rotate when I get a whole bunch of them at one time. So they're all in the same thing. Now, the other thing, and I'll send this out as an email to remind people, use white paper. Do not use heavily lined paper, especially really uh, a bold grid graph paper because when you set your contrast to dark, the background grid overwhelms the writing and makes it really difficult to see. But I need you to set the contrast to a darker setting because a lot of times you guys are writing in black ink, but it's coming out looking like this. It's so light because the contrast is so light that what I'm seeing is not what you sent. It's some lighter version. So I say white paper, black ink, take the picture in good light, no shadows, and make sure your contrast is set. That, that's a very, very easy thing to do. So you're just gonna send me all the pages and, and that's it. Now, many of you will get done early and that's fine. I, I would prefer that you continue to work. Now, the exam itself, there are 14 questions. You have to do 10. That means you do not have to be an expert on every single thing. So if you're looking at two problems and go, I know this one, that one, I'm not so sure, skip it. You can always come back. There are, I believe, I believe there are five applications and there are nine integrations you have to do at least three of the applications. You could do all five of them if you want. You just have to do at least three. You can do as many integrals as you want. Now, here's the thing. You have to do 10 problems. Most of you will finish 10 problems long before two hours. I also throw an extra credit question on every exam. The extra credit question is an over and above challenge from the material you are being tested on. It's not coming from some other source. So it might be a gnarly application or a really gnarly integration by parts, but something that you're being tested on, it's an over and above. It isn't all or nothing. You know, if you get halfway through, you can get half of the credit. I think it would be extremely foolish to turn in an exam with time on the clock, not having attempted the extra credit. Can't hurt you, can only help you. Now, the reason for the extra credit is real simple. Almost every person who takes a math test not everybody, but almost everybody blows a problem that they know inside and out. So, you know, one of you, an hour before class, you were tutoring your classmates on integration by part because you're the guru. And now everybody in the class got that problem right, except for you, because when you looked at it, you saw something else, right? This, is, this happens to everybody at some point. So you missed a problem that you knew inside and out because when you looked at it, you just saw something else. And of course, we know how it works. Five minutes after you turn in your exam, clarity. Well, it's too late by then. I put the extra credit on there as sort of a buyback for that question. The only thing I care about, I, I don't care about your score. I just want to know that your score is an accurate reflection of your knowledge. If you know it, it, the material at an A level, then a B test would be unacceptable. If you know this at a B level, then a B test is fantastic because it means you were able to show everything you knew. So I want to know that that score is a true reflection. So I throw that on there as kind of a buyback. Having said that, it is possible then to get over 100%. There are always somebody that does that. The only difference between the 95% and the 100% is the 100%er was better at catching the proofreading errors, you know, the, the drop negatives, the, you know, just the, the silly mistakes that are just small, but they add up over time because you have a whole lot of them. The 100%er just caught all those silly errors. But the person who's the excellent proofreader is the one who's going to get the over 100 because they caught all their small errors and then they got the extra credit. Now, you did enough of everything. You did enough applications. You did enough integrals. You've now answered 10 questions. First thing you do, check. Okay, look for the whoppers. Look for the, oh my God, I 
totally messed up this integration. You know, I put in verse 10 and it should be natural log. You know, that's a, that's a biggie. You do your check. If there's still time on the clock, do the extra credit. Great. Now you find there's still time on the clock. There's still 15, 20 minutes left. Go back and do an extra problem. I call that insurance. It's not going to count probably, but let's just say you did seven integrals and one of the integrals you just totally, you totally messed up because you, again, you looked at, you saw something else. Do one extra problem. Now, when I'm grading them, I'm just going to take the best ones anyway. So if I'm asking you to do 10, if time allows it, of course you should do 11. That's insurance. And I'll, I'll take the best ones because you never know when you messed one up. Now, the vast majority of you, first of all, almost every single person on every single test does at least one extra problem. That's the norm. And most people, the extra problem doesn't end up counting. There's a reason you didn't do it on the first round. You said, I felt less confident about that one. That's why I didn't do it. But there's others of you that can do every single problem on the test equally. So you just did them all in order. Oh, okay, now let me do an extra. Let me do another extra. What I would strongly discourage, and this happens every single test, and it's going to happen with someone in here. I'm going to ask you 14 questions. You have to do 10. There's an extra credit. Every single time I do this, there will be individuals who do all 14, but don't have enough time to do the extra credit. That's foolish because four of those didn't even count. They don't even get graded, basically. And you didn't do the extra credit. No, don't do 14, do 11. And if you really feel aggressive and energetic, do, do a 12th one. But you know your 13th and 14th aren't going to count. <laughs> Why did you put them off till the end? Because you didn't feel as good about them. So a perfect test for me is that you did 11 and the extra credit. Now you've absolutely maximized your score. But all you have to do is 10. Now, what if you're just not working fast and you only get eight or nine? Well, you don't have to be perfect on all of them, but you have to be good. You can still get a good score. But at that time, that just means you probably worked a little bit too slow. And every problem on here is a problem we've already done. We've done every problem on here. In fact, I've done every problem on there in great detail. I've got posted notes, there's keys. So if you've been practicing the problems in the text, every problem on the exam, you're gonna blow away. If you haven't been, then when you look at the integrals, they all look like the same question. Now, what can you bring? First of all, you cannot use a graph and calculator. You're being tested on integration. <laughs> That's pretty much nationally. You can't use a graph and calculator on a calculus test. No, you can use a cheap, you know, this is my $9 Casio that has about 200 functions and everything is a main key. There's no menu options. Now, do you need a calculator on this test? Actually, you don't. But there is arithmetic. Let's say you're doing a fluid force problem. To me, it's really silly to do awesome calculus and then have the wrong numerical answer because you multiply two numbers badly. That's, you know, your, your reward for doing awesome calculus should be you get full credit for the problem. But if your arithmetic is bad, you're gonna have a wrong answer. So use the calculator to multiply out the numbers. Don't sit there and do that pencil and paper off to the side, run the risk of an incorrect calculation. And by the way, that's the only thing you're gonna need the calculator for at all during the entire test. So have a cheap calculator at your side, right? You know, an exponent key, a root key, multiply, divide, that's probably about all you need. <laughs> all right, so have that. And what about formulas? Well, the way it works in Calc and above in any of my classes, any theorem, formula, or definition that we have derived in this class, you can write down. That means that at the back of your syllabus where I have that whole thing of derivatives and integrals, those are all the things you were supposed to know verbatim before the first day of class. You can't bring that. Nope, you can't bring a book. You can't bring your notebook, but you can write down theorems, formulas, definitions. Well, what, then what have we learned? Well, do all of you know the center of mass formulas off the top of your head, MX, MY, X bar, Y bar? I would write that one down. Now, although it's not an issue, That's the integration by parts formula. I don't think you need to write it down, but you certainly can because halfway through the test, oh my God, is it a plus, is it a minus? Wait, was it UV, was it VU? You can't afford that error, okay? It's not really a formula, but that's, that's the substitution we derived in this class. You didn't know that before this class. You can write that. What you can't do are put down examples. You can't have worked out examples or, or you know, the Xerox old quiz questions because that would be open book at that point. It's not an open book test. 
But the flip side is a closed book test, no formulas, no nothing. I find that to be very stressful. So if there's a theorem formula definition, oh, nothing, the evil trig. Oh my God, does anybody know the evil trig formulas? You could do 50 problems and not know them inside and out. So you're right, the evil trick. That's the one, remember, where we said let u be tangent of a half x and then went from there. You don't have to derive it. No, you just have to correctly use it. So I would definitely write those down. Now, I don't need you to have a formula card. You may not need you to have a formula card, but because you're allowed, I think it would be foolish not to make one. And here's why I want you to make one. Most everybody in every class I've ever taught, when they get done with the test, and I'll say, how many times did you look at the formula card? The universal answer is always the same. They never looked at it. And then they'll say, well, why did I bother making it? That's why you bothered making it. You see, it's not the existence of the formula card that's important, it's the creation. In making the formula card, you are identifying what you consider the most important things that you have to know, theorems, formulas, definitions, and you put them down in an organized fashion. In other words, you were forcing yourself to review all the things you said were the most important. Then when you sit down and take the test, You've already reviewed those things. You rarely ever have to look at it other than to say, was it a plus or a minus? And that's why I, you do that. And it takes a lot of the stress off you to have to memorize. You don't want to have to memorize center of mass formulas. Come on, the evil trig. You don't want to memorize that kind of stuff. But when it comes to things like navigating through technique, you, you have to be able to do the problems, right? That's called problem solving. That's thinking on your feet. There's no formula to write down in how to think through a problem. Okay, so if you're not sure, you can ask me. Now, when you show up for the test, every single person I'm going to say, let me see your formula card. You're just going to hold it up, flip it over. Both sides are fine. Because you're taking the test on Zoom, I have to be able to see everything at all times. You can't have a book or a set of formulas off to the side that you're using. That's grounds. That's not failing. That's expulsion. There, there's no gray area there. You, you, you blatantly cheat on a test. You're, you're, out of, you're out of school. If you're out of school, you're out of college pretty much. That, that's that's someplace you don't want to go so you get to write down formulas and if you're well practiced you're you're fine that's not even an issue um let's see if you're a dsps student you need to talk to me because your your circumstances are going to be slightly different particularly like with the formula card you're not going to be able to just bring it to there they have to already have it so you'll talk to me about that that's kind of a, a small but a separate thing um does anybody have a quick question on logistics, not on problems. I'm going to do problems. Later. I have a quick question. How big did you say the formula card could be? This is an three by five. Okay. Um, one of these? Right now, based on what we, yeah, one of those. Right now, based on what we have, it's extremely unlikely you could even fill up one side. We don't have that many formulas, but there's also terminology. That's people don't think about this. In my linear algebra class, the majority of things that they write down are definitions and theorems. There's hardly any formulas because there's vocab that is unfamiliar at the time you're learning it. You know, I'm talking about one-to-one -one on two functions with isomorphisms and things like this. These are really important vocab words that if you don't know what it means, you can't even answer the question. Well, in our class, there haven't been a lot, but I have made reference to, for example, transient terms multiple times today. If that's not a word you're familiar with, then, then that could potentially be an issue, couldn't it, at some point? Because if there's a vocab word that you're not sure of, you know, I, I don't know if there is any. I don't know if there is any. But there may be terminology, and there certainly will be before the end of the course. There will be vocab words that we'll use. You'll go, I'm not, I don't know that word well. I would write it down. There are certain theorems that allow us to do certain things that write them down. When we get to the next chat, the next thing, sequences and series, most of what you write down are going to be theorems, not formulas, because they will allow you to proceed in a problem. So if you're not sure, just ask. Again, you can't have anything from a prior class, no trig identities, those you're supposed to know, no, no integrals and derivative formulas, but don't worry. Uh, the test is not going to be all about integrating inverse hyperbolic cotangents and, you know, things like that. You're going to be doing all mainstream stuff. That's all we've done so far is mainstream stuff. And I remind people, obscure fun functions are obscure for a reason. They don't come up a lot. So we're not going to have a test that's nothing but obscure functions. You have to be able to integrate polynomials and sines and cosines and things that produce logs. But that's what you're comfortable with, right? Obscure is not what you should be concerned with. So always think mainstream. And if you're going through the homework and practice, you realize, yeah, you're not doing a lot of obscure. You're doing mostly everything mainstream. And just, re, you know, 
refamiliarizing. Now, if there's no other logistical questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop. We'll come back for office hours. Really quick, just in, just in case, you said we get we could have both sides of the card. Yes. Okay. And so this this is the funny. I one. I don't want to accidentally mess that up. Diego's heard me say this before. Both sides, both sides, both sides, both sides. I, I say it four times, and then what will happen is the day of. Well, you said only one side. This happens every test, every class. No, both sides, just because I don't want you to do micro writing. We all know what that means. I try to fit as much as I can. I write micro, and then when I look at it, I can't actually read any of it because it's just too small. And do you need can, us to have our computer and like a like? Do you need to see? I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I basically just you writing and at your workstation. That having said that, I always have fun with this. Last semester, I, Diego was probably in my class. Last semester, as soon as I was okay, let's get started. Here's what here's what people do. <laughs> I, I would have this and I'd just be cracking up going guys you're kind of missing the point I would have people immediately take themselves completely out of the dish or the one guy he'd, he'd do this every time he'd turn his body in such a way that all I would get would get this <laughs> yeah you really should so if I just like I'm trying to think how like if, just just yeah it's just I gotta be able to just see common sense things. I guess Com I, I don't Yes, but I don't know if I would agree with what common sense is. It's, okay, the, the, the only alternative is the Proctorio software. How many of you have had to use that in other classes? I, I, don't, I, I don't like that. I, um, I, I just, I don't like even the idea. I know it's necessary. It's a necessary evil. The Proctorio software is basically you blink. You know, I get an alert that you're cheating. You know? I mean, it's just, it's a little over the top. I had a student last semester who had a, a high school sibling. And this is not an exaggeration. And in a local San Diego high school, and when all of their work, they had the computer on them, and then they had to have side cameras, two side cameras. That way, there's no possibility they could be sneaking anything in. This is high school. I, I think that that's the definition of paranoia. If somebody's going to cheat, they're going to cheat regardless of how. I, I don't want you guys to feel like. You're under the white, white, white hot spotlight and somebody's staring at you. Yeah, I am staring at you. But what I do is I typically take my picture off so it doesn't feel like I'm staring at you. And then I just keep going back and forth between my, you know, Hollywood Squares, you know, Brady Bunch screen because there's going to be 40 people. Now, this is one thing I will ask of you also day of to remind you. Okay, first of all, you're all going to be muted because you're never going to need to speak out loud. So Lisi has a question. Lisi sends me the question through chat but you send me the question. So all of you need to be mindful of that. When you chat me, please do not chat the class. And you guys have all had this happen, I'm sure. You're doing something and you keep seeing chats show up. What, what do your eyes do? You can't help you look at them. I will get a hundred chats during the exam and you're gonna look at every one of them, even though all of them were to me, none of them involve you, you can't help but be distracted. Much the same way as if somebody's talking the entire time. So I tell people, chat me, <laughs> and, and you won't need to talk. I will not talk unless it's absolutely necessary. You know, there's 30 minutes left. You know, that would be something I'd say. But more than likely, okay, Kai has, he, has chatted me about problem three, and then Diego chatted me about problem three, and then Joshua chatted me about problem three. I'll go, okay, currently problem three is kind of confusing. So then I'll say, everybody, listen up for a moment. On problem three, this is what I'm asking you, just to make sure. I will always do that if more than one person asks me the same question. But if one of you asks me one question and it never happens again, no, I, I don't need to do that because it, it's distracting. But at the same time, if there's even a possibility of misinterpretation, you know what you're doing, but you misinterpreted it because there was just enough ambiguity in the question, then that's my fault. So then I will make it perfectly clear. Okay, so that's that's basically the only time I'm going to talk to you. You know, if you're messing up, you're doing something, I'm probably going to chat you now. I've chatted you and you haven't responded that I might have to say, you know, Diego, check your chat. <laughs> because you guys are doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're, you're, you're doing a test. But if you chat me, be, you know, wait, look for the answer. I may not answer immediately for two reasons. One is when you chat me, it only stays on for about five seconds. And because I'm going to multiple screens, I may not see the chat. But what I do see is under the chat, I'll see numbers. How many chats have just gone up? So then I'll go and look at the chat. Um, the number one chat, <laughs> does anybody know what the number one chat is that I get by a lot? <laughs> it's funny. It's can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> I think that's funny, but you, you're like, you're at home. 
no, what I'd rather you say is like, Griffin's got to go to the bathroom. Griffin just chats me and says, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Because otherwise I'm like, what happened to Griffin? You know, so John says, you know, I, I've got to, I'm going to go get a drink. Well, I don't care. But if you're going to physically get up and leave the screen and you haven't turned in your test, yeah, you should be telling me that you're going somewhere, what you're going to do. Because otherwise I'm wondering, okay, I haven't seen them in a half an hour. <laughs> you know, I'm assuming that the test is coming. Now at the end of the test, okay, um, most of you will have turned it in. I don't need one person to turn a test in early. I want you to turn a test in when you're done and when you've checked and you, it's as good as you can get. You're done and maybe I say, okay, time's up. All right, everybody. So there's still 15 or 20 of you still hanging around. This is what most people do, and I think it's why. So, so you know, Joshua takes a picture, he sends me his, his test. Nothing's happening. Maybe a couple minutes later, it shows up. I say, okay, Joshua, got yours, you're clear. That's what most people do. They wait around, I'll say, okay, yeah, Diego, I got yours, you're good. Because a lot of times, you know, John, John, I haven't got yours yet, you know, or, or five minutes later, okay, Griffin, I haven't got yours yet. You know, Lisi, I, I, I'm, I'm still waiting on yours, and you're going, God, I'm trying to do it. But I, I'm just letting you know, if it's at the end of the test, now, if you turn it in a half hour into, you know, there's half hour to go, you turn it in, you left. I'm not going to announce to the class, Ashley, I got your test. No, it's not, that's not necessary. But what you might do, so Kai has done a half hour early and he sends me his test. What you might want to do, Kai, is chat me, say, I just turned in my test. And then I'll chat you back, got it. Nobody else needs to hear that. But then you have the confirmation that I got it because every now and then weird things happen. Okay, we know that, that weird things can happen and they always pick the worst times to happen, <laughs> okay? So I don't want anybody here to feel uncomfortable. You're going to have plenty of time to do the test. Again, I'm going to start it a little bit early just so you can do whatever. If you have a printer, print it because I left tons of room on each page. The quiz is I just put all the problems down, then that way you can take as much room as you want to write. The exams, most of them have like two problems per eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, tons of room to write. So if, if you print the exam, just write the problems, you know, there. But the other thing is when you're sending me the PDF, please, one PDF. I will have people, I'll have 10 pages and they will send me 10 PDFs. And of course, not even a chance they're in any form of order. <laughs> and it takes several seconds to open each one. So I got to open each of the 10 just to figure out what's page one. I have no idea. And I, by the way, I don't grade a person's test and move on to the next test. I grade problem one on every test. And then I grade problem, that's how I always grade. Two reasons, one, it's a lot faster because you see the same things. And it also lends to much more consistency. You see, if I see the same error show up four times, don't you wanna know that it's the same score for each person? Not one person gets a higher than the other because you know I did these tests eight hours apart. So Part of the reason I do every, each problem and also makes good stopping points. Okay, I'm done with problem one. Now I can take a break. I'm done with problem two. I can take a break. So I, I grade one problem at a time on every test. That's why if, you're, if your pages aren't in some sort of order or at least in one PDF, it makes it a little bit more difficult to find your stuff. That's all. No, so that's Professor, can I ask a little recap question? Sure. So we're going to start the exam slightly early. Well, I'm going to send then... it to you slightly early just okay. so you can, you know, if, you, if we were on campus, I would hope every single person sitting in their desk several minutes before the exam actually starts. Yeah, you know, just sort of relaxing, chilling, you know, doing your. So we're gonna have time to get. We're we're gonna have time to get to the printer before the Zoom meeting, right? That's before why I'm sending starts. it to you about ten minutes early. Okay, and then so for the finish of the exam, when the time is up, you're gonna say, "Okay, pencils down," and then we're all gonna start scanning. And yes, then... but at that point, many people will have already turned in their tests and gone. Right. Yeah, so so it, assume I do take the whole time limit. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to send. I'm going to send it in, and then we're pretty much waiting for you to say that we've received our test before we. Well, go. that's up to you. I, I'm just saying. I think it's kind of a common sense thing that that you might after you send it to me, you might want to wait around. So what I like is so Lisi's just sent it to me, but I don't know Lisi sent it to me. So Lisi chats me. I just sent you the exam. Okay. okay. Then. Because what happens is they show up on my screen, not instantaneous. It, it, sometimes it's a couple of minutes. So I'm now looking, okay, I'm waiting for Lisi's exam. Okay, got it, Lisi, you're good. And, and now you know, okay, he's got my test. There's no possibility of anything bad can happen. But every now and then it has happened that, you know, the last person still, I, got, I still haven't got your test. And like, I've sent it three times. Somebody last semester had, they were having nothing but internet and Wi-Fi issues. So they ended up, they had a scanner. 
So they ended up just going to their scanner and doing it that way. Um, I don't care if you do it that way. I, I think the cell phone is just so much easier and so much faster. But if you feel more comfortable scanning it to me, that's I have no problem with that. You know, it's just as good. It, it, but that requires that you have a piece of equipment that most of you don't. That's all. So everybody's got a cell phone. That one's easy. <laughs> OK. All right. I, I do want to give you guys a break. Um, and if you want to hang around, this now is to ask questions.